You know, when I sit up here, I always think of myself as probably the luckiest person in the world, and that's especially true today. Um, in 2000, when it was the uh, 25th anniversary of the festival, the festival was really large that year. There were a lot of things going on, and there were concurrent sessions happening. And I missed what was probably um, one of the best events that has ever happened at this festival. Because it was concurrent, you had to make a choice of which event to go to, and for some godforsaken reason, I ended up going to a, a panel discussion on grading of ice climbs. <laughs> all, I can, all I can remember was people saying things like, it can't be a grade eight, there can't be a grade eight, it must be seven plus. So I listened to that for 45 minutes and then came out into the hallway and found out that uh, next door, there had been this absolutely amazing event discussing the nature of heroes and mentors and inspirations in climbing. When I went out into the hallway, people were just buzzing about this, some of them actually in tears, and I don't think I'd, I'd really seen that that often at the festival. What I was hearing was particularly there had been one person who had said some remarkable things, and people continued to use that word about Tom Hornbein for the rest of the festival that year, that he was simply remarkable in the way that he was thinking, in the support he was giving people, in the intelligence that he showed, in the way that he had understood climbing. But he's that in so many other ways as well. I'm sorry if I have to read this out. You'll understand why in a, in a minute. There's such a long list of things that Tom has done. I talked to colleagues of Tom's, and they described him as a physician of remarkable compassion and ability. In our world, we make heroes of climbers who have saved one individual, but let's be realistic. Tom has saved literally hundreds of lives. He's an honored educator. He was chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Washington School of Medicine for decades. He's the recipient of the Distinguished Teaching Award from the University of Washington School of Medicine. He delivered the fourth annual Ernest O. Henschel Memorial Lectureship and delivered the prestigious Rovenstein Lecture at the American Society of Anesthesiologists. In 1991, he was made a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science. Tom is also a distinguished researcher with over academic, 80 academic papers behind him. He was the editor of the Journal of American Physiological Society from 1967 to 1973, the associate editor of anesthesiology from 1989 to 1991, and he continues to sit on the editorial board of the Journal of Applied Physiology. Closer to our world, Tom has forever been one of the foremost thinkers and writers on hypoxia and the effects of altitude. His book, High Altitude, An Exploration of Human Adaptation, remains a bible of human physiology. And then there have been those climbs, and in particular, that one climb. On May 22, 1963, Tom and his beloved partner, Willie Unsell, uh, summited Everest via the unclimbed West Ridge and then descended down the other side of the mountain, bivouacking in the open above 28,000 feet. Reinhold Messner called their climb the bravest and best climb of that mountain ever. Tom and Willie were just the 11th and 12th people to the top of the world. When he returned, Tom completed one of the great classics of mountain riding, Everest the West Ridge. Tom has had a lifetime of recognition for both his climbs and his contributions to mountain culture. He is a recipient of the prestigious Hubbard Medal from the National Geographic Society. He was an honorary member of the Appalachian Mountain Club, the American Alpine Club, the Alpine Club, the Mountaineers, and the China Association for Scientific Expeditions. And at 82, Tom is still exploring. He's teaching himself to play Mozart and Bach on the piano. <laughs> he's still at the forefront of thinking about altitude. He's still mentoring young climbers. And he's still out there bashing and thrashing, following his much younger friends in their 50s up 5'9". He's still all the things that he talked about back in 2000. A mentor, an inspiration, and to many people here today, me included, a hero. Tom Hornby. <laughs> Now, one of the things that you, um, you've been saying to me over the past little while is that you prefer not to talk about Everest, but I think we're probably going to end up going there a few times during the day, if that's okay with you. <laughs> I, I guess that I have to live with the sins of my past. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to begin um, kind of at, uh, maybe not the beginning of that trip, but a, a, an important midpoint for you, and that was on February 22nd, 1963, you um, stepped on a plane headed for Asia and you s started writing a letter. What did you write in the letter that you wrote home? I don't know. <laughs> you promised you weren't going to do this to me. 
Is it in the book? <laughs> no, it's not in the book, actually. Yeah. Then I really don't know. I, I can't answer. I mean, I don't know. I, all I know is how I felt sitting on that plane. Uh, and I'm sure for many of you who have been through these same experiences, it's, it's not a unique experience, which is the pain of parting. And for my then wife and five kids, Seems like a crazy thing to be going off to climb Everest, mm -hmm. leaving. You know, it, it was for a brief moment just that sense of the doors closing, the plane leaving uh, its parking spot and taxiing, and you just stop for a moment and think, what in the hell am I doing? Mm -hmm. And then the plane leaves the ground, and it's like a switch flips, and suddenly you're in forward. And that part that you've left behind is not gone by any means. It was a constant throughout the expedition, partly of just wanting to get the damn thing climbed and go home to my family. At the same time, you're totally focused on what's in front of you because it's pretty absorbing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then you come back to reality eventually. Fear at that point? What? Fear of going? Fear? No, I think I was too stupid for that. Uh, uh, I'd, I guess I'd, yeah, I'd been to the Himalaya for my first time to the Karakoram in, in 1960 on Meisherbrum with Willie and uh, the trio of us, Dick Emerson, who will come forward here in a moment, I guess. Mm -hmm. And we had agreed that we knew this was going to be a big expedition, but if we all went as a trio, it would be a hell of a lot of fun to be part of the, this thing. And so we did, and the, uh, uh, but on Meisherbrim, I, I re all the uncertain, a lot of the uncertainties about how you would do at high altitude or how I would do at altitude had been pretty well resolved. And I had this maybe not rational feeling that if I didn't get sick, I was going to be fine uh, in managing uh, at least the altitude of Everest which of course is its most unique element. Mm -hmm. And the climbing, well, we'll get to that later, I guess. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the arc for you compared to some other people who've sat up here in the chair that you're in right now from um, early childhood to eventually ending up in mountains. For, for a number of other people, they had um, parents that introduced them to the mountains, they had um, early experiences either living near the mountains or thinking of them really clearly that you can kind of see how people ended up on Mount Everest or on Masherbrum. For you, it's kind of a different story. <laughs> one of the things that I should mention is that um, <laughs> if there's one probably really shortest book in all of uh, mountain history telling, it would probably be uh, famous Jewish mountaineers. If there aren't too many people in there, I think it's probably maybe you and Moses, and that's about <laughs> it. <laughs> I, think, I think Jeff Tabin belongs there. Oh, Jeff Tabin. <laughs> Mountains weren't part of your background. They weren't part of your early story. Can you talk a little bit about some of your roots and, and how you ended up in the mountains? Well, you know, I guess you have to think there's some throwbacks in the genes. I can remember as a kid growing up in St. Louis just climbing on houses, our house. I had a lot of roots on our house. <laughs> and uh, trees. And uh, for reasons that I never got around to really asking my parents until after it was, I was, it was too late and I couldn't. When I was 13, they sent me to a camp very near where we're living in Estes Park now. In Colorado. And I met mountains and discovered that mountains had it all over houses and trees. And as I look back on my life uh, and think of what I like to call pivotal events, that was numero uno because mountains uh, have defined my life ever since in my choice of profession, my research, my relationships, my friendships. Uh, uh, they, uh, they've all been defined by this love of these things that we all here are so hooked on. Did your parents have a sense of that when they sent you to this camp? Do you I don't think so. Uh, uh, they were both sort of couch potatoes in a sense. Uh, and I don't think they knew what they were getting in for. They may well have at times regretted what they did, but uh, they were also very proud of their son. And you know, as I sat here listening to your, 
introduction, which uh, verged on the embarrassing, uh, I just I couldn't help think that if they were sitting here, what they would think of young Tommy. Uh, <laughs> and well, you did become a doctor, so you fit that. that <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, and when, when you first had your first encounters with mountains, when you went to Estes Park and then you started climbing more and more, you did quite a few things um, in that area when you um, spent more time there. What was it about mountains that captured you? Can you do you have a sense of, of what appealed to you about the exploration and adventure of mountains? Well, I don't know that there's anything probably terribly unique about that, uh, though we have different mixes. but. I mean, beyond just the sheer physical beauty, the uh, what I'm experiencing now in my old age, back where I met them first, uh, of feeling like I'm living in fairy tale land, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure I was as, as astute back then to that, but it was magnificent. And then, of course, there's just the individual testing and play of learning how your body works, and of learning to cope with the uncertainty and, and controlling the fear of just leading rock, simply leading rock and mm -hmm. on places where no one's ever been and not quite sure where you're going to end up. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just part and parcel of what climbing is, not for everybody nowadays, but for most of the people that I see and know sitting here today, uh, it's the same kind of stuff of of learning about yourself. Mm -hmm. Were you a natural? Well, I don't know what a natural is. Uh, if I look at the uh, at the way people climb nowadays, I'd say I was adult. Uh, <laughs> but I was small. I was skinny. I my I was strong. I didn't have to think too much. Uh, my arms. It wasn't until I got old that I had to change my whole climbing style. Uh, and be grateful for the climbing shoes that one wears now instead of boots, uh, which are worth 40 or 50 years of aging. And then I had to start to really use my brain because my body was no longer the body that uh, did everything that I asked of it. A mm -hmm. um, number of the guests have also sat in your chair because um, this is a mountain book festival have talked about inspiration from mountain literature. Any of that in, in your story? Well, probably the when in my teens, the how many have any of you ever read Omen's High Conquest? Mm -hmm. Oh, isn't that fascinating? There's a couple of hands going up. I mean, this is ancient history to most of you here, but uh, James Ramsey Omen was a professional writer, uh, a bit of a mountaineer, and a uh, very much a uh, and a, I guess he kind of hero worshipped mountaineering and mountaineers in some way. Uh, he was also the scribe, the official scribe for our Everest expedition. But he had written a history of mountaineering called High Conquest. This was written before Everest was first climbed in 1953, in my teen years of the 40s. And in it were accounts of the disasters on Nanga Parbat and, you know, just, and the uh, 1953 attempt by Charlie Houston, who sat in this chair some years back. Uh, and that team uh, uh, that first attempted to do a reconnaissance of K2 in 1938. And you know, I never dreamed then that I would end up knowing uh, a lot of these people who were bigger than life to me, thanks to Omen. And uh, the, uh, I mean, it, it, was, it was sort of a magical book to step into. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was all fantasy land. I never, I never imagined I would ever see the Himalaya. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even an aspiration, really. And then as I got into uh, from college into going and applying to and getting into medical school, it really sort of just dropped off the scene entirely. I was much more focused on what I wanted to do with my life as as a. Uh, uh, as a physician and teacher and researcher. A niggling thing in the back of your head, though, to... Well, yeah, it was always the there. And then my, my dear old buddy, who was, uh, much to his dismay, three years younger than I, Nick Clinch, from our camping days, invited me to go to Masher Room in 1960. And, of course, that probably mm -hmm. burst it wide open. And uh, when 
I got the postcard from Durenforth asking if I'd be interested in going to Everest, and Willie and Dick and I made our pact by, well, mm -hmm. uh, that defined things that I never would have imagined, including, I have to say, sitting here in this room right now. It's just, it's probably just as well I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> um, I, I do want to talk a bit about Masher Room because um, I think, unfortunately, a number of people have a sense of Tom as being Everest, and that's kind of the whole package. And there's a lot of other things that Tom has done um, before that and since. But one of the things that you've talked to me about um, in the last while is seeing yourself as an amateur climber. And it's, it's, it was a very different world then, um, thinking about going to the Himalaya for the, the first couple of times. Was, was the Himalaya part of, of the American consciousness at all at that point? Like, if you talked to people about what you were thinking about doing, would they, would they know it? Would they get it at all? I, I don't know. Uh, you know, you look at the expeditions that Charlie, the, the, 30, the 36 Nana Devi and 38 K2 and 53, that iconic expedition. Known by the public at that point? No, I don't know. I think the public didn't know anything until Herzog's book, Annapurna, came out. And uh, and so I don't, I can't speak for where the public was at. But even in mountaineering, uh, I think it was Norman's passion that led to Everest. I don't know that there was anybody else in this country terribly thinking it was something that they wanted to do or it was very accessible to put to gather an expedition, making expeditions happen then is a whole different ball game mm -hmm. than it is now. I, it, it's so easy to go there, but it was the ends of the earth back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, the effort and the expense and the organization were pretty mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. So it was his vision and passion that let that come to pass. Mm -hmm. When you went to Masherbrum, why, why that mountain? Maybe tell people a little bit about it if they don't know what, what Masherbrim is or what it was at that point. Well, Masherbrim is, is just one of the peaks up in the Karakoram near K2. Actually, its appellation is K1, but nobody knows that and there's no reason they should. Uh, it's a little over 25,000 feet high. It had been attempted, I think, on two or three occasions by the Brits before, and including one, one with Don Willens, and John Hunt was on one. Uh, and they, it proved to be a difficult mountain. Mm -hmm. And Nick, after having put together the uh, expedition to Hidden Peak in 1958, Nick Clinch, uh, where, it's, where they just succeeded in climbing one of the 14, 8,000 meter peaks, the only one first, the only one that Americans made a first descent of, uh, then got permission from Asher Room, and he asked me to go along partly as the dock. Uh, climbing docks were not uh, bouncing out of the cubicles everywhere back in those days. <laughs> so, uh, and we had climbed a little after our camp days. Uh, and that's how I think I became a part of that. He, he knew I was a, a wiry little monkey rock climber and they thought they might need that particular attribute there. And that's not where I first met Willie and Dick, but. Uh, that's where we really all came together. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, I'm sure that if I hadn't been on that trip, I would have never surfaced to be invited to go on uh, the Everest expedition. You, um, you wrote an article about uh, the Mashroom expedition that was um, the first bit of mountain riding, I think, that I'd seen that, that you did. And it was interesting, you bookended that, that piece with um, a couple of things. One of them was a quote it's, it's, it's a lovely but horrible quote, and I'll get you to talk about it in a second here, Tom, but um, it begins the article, Masherbrum is a male mountain. By that, I mean it does, not, it does not throw unexpected avalanches or hidden difficulties at you. <laughs> <laughs> now, I just, I need to clarify, you, you didn't write that, but you quoted that in there, and then you, you answer that at the end of the trip, answer that with a, a response to that from, from your own point of view. Just, can you talk a little bit about, um, the unexpected avalanches and uh, hidden difficulties that Master been through at you folks. <laughs> Boy, you have done a hell of a lot of homework, I've got to say. So. <laughs> I'm being nailed on my own petard, I think. <laughs> it was, uh, in a certain sense, Master Brim was uh, far more uh, quixotic and, uh, in a way, challenging than Everest was. 
uh, for us. We were a small, wonderfully cohesive little team. I was a, the counterpoint between a little expedition like some of you guys know so well, and the Everest expedition was pretty striking. And we knew, we sensed that before we signed up for Everest. But uh, we, were, we were just a small cohesive group doing our thing, pushing our way up. Uh, a quixotic uh, hillside when, well, I guess the avalanche you're referring to is we were coming, we realized that we we're sitting on this huge face of very steep snow and, and it was snowing and snowing and snowing and we thought, you know, we better get the hell off of here. Uh, and so we started down and uh, as the four of us, George Bell, who had been on K2 and Willie and I and Dick McGowan, were traversing this slope and you could barely see the next person on the road. Uh, suddenly this uh, mass of stuff comes wall walling up and just gently pushes you off the mountainside and you're on your way. And uh, Willie happened to be on the edge of the slide, did a couple of cartwheels and then got his ax in. And, and whereas I had been the highest on the rope at the, before the avalanche, I was now at the bottom of the heap. Uh, and the avalanche, we all stopped. The avalanche went on over the cliffs. And Nick Clinch, our organizer uh, of the expedition, was heading up below, uh, beginning to try to figure out on his fingers how many orphans were going to be left if uh, we had been nailed. But fortunately, I mean, we were lucky and we didn't. When you look back and you think about that trip in particular and then the way that uh, Norman Dyrenforth kind of saw you and some of the other people that came out of that trip. What are the characteristics that you think helped you do as well as you did on mountains of that kind of size? What do you have that other people don't necessarily have? Well, my parents would say stubbornness. Mm -hmm. My sisters referred to me as Tom Mule. <laughs> so there you have it. <laughs> Uh, I've, I, I've always seemed to do well at altitude, so I, there's probably something in the genes there, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I never regarded myself as an athlete. Uh, in, uh, you know, I don't have any remarkable VO2 maxes to show off or anything like that. Uh, just passion and, and uh, determination. And determination, yeah. Um, your wife, Kathy, and a couple of other of your friends as well also told me that they don't see you as having a, a risk gene, if that makes any sense. They don't, they don't see you as somebody who takes unnecessary risks. You're pretty calculated, you're pretty thoughtful, and one of your, your friends even described you as pretty scientific in your approach to taking chances on mountains. What, what sense do you make of that? Um... Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I've thought a lot about risk, because, not just because of climbing, but because of my medical profession and anesthesiology, because it's an ever-present aspect of life, and not in every aspect of life. Uh, I, and, and looking at the people you climb with, I've, I got so I sort of graded risk on this analog pain scale that we use, you know, what's your pain like from one or 10? Uh, and you can do that with risk too, and risk taking. Uh, and at the ten scale, end of the scale are the stimulus addicts, uh, or adrenaline junkies, or whatever you want to call them, where risk is uh, is really an, an essential part of the experience. I think. And what they seek in the experience. And, and seek in it, yeah. 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 And at the other stream, of course, are people who are risk averse, and uh, there's of course they don't know that they can't get away with, they can't escape it anyway who might think being in bed is probably the safest place to be the whole time. Uh, and I, we'd look at each other as, uh, you gravitate in climbing, I think, to, to teammates who have about the same risk number on that scale as you do, uh, that you're comfortable with. And when you get people who are too far away from you, you generally look for somebody else to be a climbing partner with. Mm -hmm. uh, my, uh, uh, the guys that I tended to climb with, uh, Bill Sumner and uh, uh, Pete Shoning and uh, most of I think we thought, sort of saw ourselves around a six or a seven. Uh, we had one or two that were an eight, maybe, or nine. Uh, and they were distinctly a little bit more gung-ho than I would tend to be. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's probably not very objective trying to scale, grade your own risk-taking, so I don't know how 
good a job I've done. But, but you have that, that sense of persistence and determination. Does that, does that not kind of push you into areas of risk that might be outside of your six or seven? Well, I think it can push you, and it has me. I can certainly think of examples in my professional, professional life where I should have bailed on something, mm -hmm. uh, but my stubbornness of wanting to succeed just kept me persisting past the point where uh, it was probably useful to anybody to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I, you know, that balance of that counterpoint, I mean, we have uh, a few astute people have criticized Willie and me over the years for the commitment that we made in this climb on Everest. Mm -hmm. And maybe with justification, because if, uh, if we hadn't succeeded, we'd be uh, just among the bodies up there. Mm -hmm. And the response would be those stupid asses, they should have known better. Mm -hmm. So. But we don't often criticize the people who do succeed, right? We, that's we, right. You made that point in, in, this, in, your, in Strange and Dangerous Dreams that uh, if you pull it off, it smells a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> may not have used those words exactly. But. <laughs> Um, so it, it, interesting that idea then about um, you know finding people who are um, consistent with you and your approach to mountains and your risk taking and so on. That's easier to do when you're an intact core of people who invite one another as you did in Masherbrum. But when you go to Everest, somebody else is pulling those people together and, and pulling people out of the ether who you may have never uh, climbed with before or may have never even met before. Talk about that team. How how was that team formed and? How do you look back and think about the players who were involved in that trip? Well, I think the team was fundamentally formed by Norman. And I think one of his major uh, conditions of, of selecting members of the team was whatever sense he could get of their ability to be team players. Because mountaineering back in those days of expedition style uh, climbing in the Himalaya, was really the goal of getting, the goal was to get to the summit. Not to get everybody to the summit, but to get two people maybe to the summit. And that meant that everybody on the team uh, was, knew that they might have a chance of being that person, but we're all in it together to help make the, the goal, uh, to achieve the goal. Mm -hmm. And some people, uh, do do well with that, and others don't. I think Norman did a remarkable job of putting together a team that had that as one of its elements beyond you know the experience everybody had in different venues as mountaineers and so forth. And that may have been one of his strongest accomplishments. Uh, one he didn't do as well in 1971 on this international Everest expedition with too many prima donnas. Uh, throwing eggs and rocks at each other or something. What a waste of eggs. Uh, but, and I don't think he really, when he was put, doing this, I don't think he knew that we were going to end up with two teams uh, competing with each other for uh, two different routes on the mountain. Mm -hmm. And that could have turned, as you can well imagine, into uh, a real Donnybrook, except for the fact that though we could grumble we also knew how to relate to each other, and we knew how to, we could compromise like our Congress doesn't seem to do, south of the border here doesn't do these days. And uh, you know, there was something in it, looking back on it, that was pretty damned impressive. Mm -hmm. well, I, one thing that's really interesting about that trip is this idea of there were two separate objectives, uh, and the, the um, balancing act between those two, and that was to get either either get somebody up the, the normal South Call route and or put somebody up the West Ridge and then do the first traverse of the mountain. One was an objective that had already been achieved several times at that point, although there's still, when you, when you folks left for the mountain, there still had only been six ascents of the peak. That's a, that's a pretty big undertaking then to, to see that, but it was on, you knew that that one route had already been done. Mm -hmm. And in fact, on that, that one route, there was only 200 feet that had been unclimbed since, you know, for, from a long, long time earlier. Whereas what you were trying in the West Ridge, there were 2,000 unclimbed feet the last day that you and Willie went to the top. That's a, that's a pretty distinct difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, in looking at the idea of the West Ridge, what did you know about the route at that point? Well, what, I, I guess I should back up a little. Uh, I didn't invent this idea of climbing it. I, well, sort of maybe I did, but Norman... He's being modest. Norman planted the seed when he came to visit me when I was serving my time in the Navy at the Naval Hospital in San Diego. And he had already gotten the hint that the team was not terribly interested in the things he was promoting to raise money for the expedition, which was a triple slam of climbing Everest, Lhotse, and Nupsi. Uh, and nobody seemed too turned on about Nupsi, uh, though it's a hell of a mountain. And <clears throat> so he suggested the possibility that maybe we could go up to the top of Everest by the South Call route and then go down the West Ridge. Mm. And he had some pictures or something, the maps that he showed me. And, and I thought about it after he left, and it seemed well, kind of suicidal <laughs> to get to the top of Everest, you know, and you're sort of on your last bit of steam and, and then heading off down the unknown side of the mountain even if you had a support group somewhere down there, it still seems pretty intimidating, though it's been done. Uh, and it wasn't, it didn't take too high an IQ to just turn it around. <laughs> <clears throat> so, and the, the one thing that we had available was a photograph that the Indian Air Force had taken of Everest in 1953, right after the mountain was climbed, with some uh, black and white, kind of gnarly looking uh, photos of that side of the mountain. And you could see this little thin couloir of snow penetrating the rock uh, for some distance before it seemed to disappear into whatever, mm -hmm. the unknown. And I focused on that. It just looked like uh, it became a fantasy. To, and I could climb into that picture uh, in my mind's eye all these months before we went to Everest and just fantasize, I was in charge of the oxygen, and I could try to think about climbing steep rock at 28,000 feet with oxygen bottles, and maybe even if it's too difficult, you'd have to uh, uh, leave your bottle, let your bottle down there and have a long rubber hose that would run up <laughs> the same length as your rope. Uh, you know, some really kind of stupid ideas. But, uh, <laughs> I, your, um, your friend Bill Summer described to me that um, you discovering what would eventually be termed the Hornbein Couloir, and we'll talk about that in a second, uh, was like giving a, a Jack Russell Terrier a bone. <laughs> you just, once you got that, you were just totally focused on it. Well, I was on, pretty uh, focused, and uh, my buddies were not, Willie in particular had another way over to the right, which wouldn't have worked as well. Uh, <laughs> hasn't yet, nobody's tried it. But anyway, uh, they tended to refer to it as Hornbein's avalanche trap. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so a very, very, very different way of looking at it. And again, it's that thing of, in retrospect, you look back at it now and you think, okay, so it, it went. You didn't necessarily know that it would actually go as far as it did to the summit. You no, didn't know didn't. what the conditions were going to be like. You didn't know what the snow was going to be like. You didn't know what the safety was going to be like. So other people were referring it to it either as Hornbein's avalanche trap or death trap or other things. And you really didn't really know until you got set into a high camp in there that it would be remotely possible at all to actually get up that thing. Well, we did, I don't think we knew until we had completed it. Then completed. We, uh, but that's the essence of virginal climbing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, important for folks to know, too, that actually even just getting up to the West Ridge, brand new terrain, very, very different kind of climbing that would be the case um, heading up to the south call, the, the normal kind of route. So along the way, as you're, you're establishing um, what's going to happen, you, you've talked about kind of splitting into two separate teams. There's one team committed to the, <coughs> the uh, southeast ridge and the south call, the other team committed to going up on the west ridge and then eventually getting up to the couloir and, and up to the summit. How separate were those teams um, in terms of the the team dynamics, the philosophy of what you were trying to do? That's a really interesting question. I would say pretty separate. Mm -hmm. uh, we interacted with each other a lot. Uh, we were, we, there was a lot of negotiation. And there were some interesting aspects of that uh, because Dick Emerson, with me as his chief assistant, were in charge of the logistics and calculating in this expedition style, you've got 
a pyramid of camps and supplies going up the mountain. And basically, uh, we two West Ridgers had control over, I mean, we were the ones that were doing all of that calculation. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was frame, it was Dick's framing and, uh, and our hours spent, and uh, I guess uh, we really could have screwed our buddies, but we didn't. But, uh, and it was done on parameters of two, te two, two man teams to the top and four man teams to the top and all kinds of stuff that could use up a whole lot of oxygen bottles and things. But there was an element of trust in that and an element of, at times, give and take, but sometimes there was more take than give, I thought, mm -hmm. in my uh, uh, fanatical way. And when we came down from our reconnaissance and they had decided that it would, the mountain had to get climbed first before we could play around on the West Ridge, uh, I was not a happy camper. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, you know, I think I behaved myself reasonably and then just went on scheming how we could just keep moving anyway. Mm -hmm. And, uh, There's a recurring theme in, in your book that's uh, quite lovely about every time uh, Norman Dyrenforth would put out that this is what the objective has to be, then you'd kind of run off to your tent and sit down with pencil and paper and try to figure out all the other ways that we could actually make that same amount of equipment be divided into two and still, still allow for the, the summit to happen. Yeah, you know, you're bringing back something I hadn't thought about for years, Jeff, and that is a lot of, I guess, a lot of the sense of the satisfaction in accomplishing the climb was in a way achieving a political end as opposed to a mount, the mountaineering aspect of it. Mm -hmm. uh, because in that complicated dynamic uh, with the negotiation and the give and take and the creativity of, you know, winches and stuff, I mean, uh, it just had, it was unique. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, part of the satisfaction of, of the success of it all coming back, of, the first American and of the, our traverse and climb was that it that it did work, mm -hmm. but it took a lot of interesting interaction mm -hmm. to pull it off. Yeah, there's two quotes that I want to um, share with you that are I think are lovely representations of what <coughs> happened on that trip. One of them uh, that Tom had written from the book is in one of the meetings, and I guess there were several meetings where the team would have to get pulled together or. Norman would, would make the proposal because it took a while to get somebody eventually up to the uh, summit of Everest via the, the Southeast Ridge. Um, he would have to make these proposals of this is what we have to do. We have to commit to, to doing the Southeast Ridge and that the, the West Ridge is, is something else entirely. So you wrote, um, Darren first said that the West Ridge is just frosting on the cake, but what he didn't know is that I much prefer frosting. <laughs> <laughs> And that idea that, I mean, that, that to you was the heart and soul of the reason that, that you were there and you, you had other allies in that, particularly Willie, in the idea of it, it's all well and good to go to the summit of Everest, but you need to go a different way to make this, this uh, the whole trip that we did, the leaving people behind and so on, um, worthy of having gone in the first place. Well, I'm not sure that I thought of it quite that way. Okay. Uh, the, uh, well, first, a comment before that. <clears throat> You know, I was passionate to the extent that people kind of referred to me as a fanatic. But uh, Willie, Dick, who was not thriving with the altitude, Barry Corbett and Jake Breitenbach before he was killed in Nashville, we're all, uh, I mean, we all had the same mindset. And it was simply that that uh, uh, was far more interesting uh, to and challenging, I mean, the seduction was really the uncertainty, the unknown of going someplace where no one's been before. And this is not unique to many of you here. Uh, there, was, there was really no issue that, about being on the South Cull route. We would have gone there if we'd had to go to just enable us to get the mountain climbed, uh, which was one of the reasons why when Jim Whitaker summited on May 1st with Nawang Gambu, uh, we were, it was like a, a gift from heaven to it us. It opened up the West Coast. <laughs> it gave us the chance to have our turn. Yeah. I want to challenge you a little bit about when you said that thing about, um, about Willie being just as committed to you because there's a lovely um, audio clip that um, where there was some conversation going back and forth again between base camp and the, the folks up on the West Ridge and trying to figure out, well, how do you apportion the resources? And uh, <laughs> Willie says in the audio quote, Look, I'm in no mood to get into an argument here because I don't give a shit, so why don't you talk to Hornbein? 
a lot of people on that trip give you credit for being the one that has the bone in your mouth, and you're the you're the one that's running with it. You had the continuous kind of reserve of of commitment to that route, even in the face of some um, some difficult conditions getting up there, and then particularly a terrible storm up at the um, the Ridge Camp at at uh, West Camp Three, and still still maintaining that, still focused on on the capacity to to go to the top and the need to go to the top. Well. Uh, yeah. I I think I was just to a significantly more obnoxious, but not not more Im, impassioned with the goal. And you know, one of the things sitting here now, 50 years later, and looking at say High and Hallowed, the film that the guys put together, Jake Norton and Dave Martin and Jim Aikman, using a lot of the footage from 50 years ago, uh, that that. Uh, yeah, I guess I feel almost a little uncomfortable sort of being the target mm -hmm. for all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, the target and, of the adulation, you mean? In the, yeah, uh, and I understand that part of it is that I'm here and most of the rest of them aren't anymore. Uh, but I also feel that uh, it, it's, not, it's not quite in balance, but mm -hmm. uh, so be it. Um, you mentioned Dick Emerson's name a couple of times. One of the really interesting things about this trip was, um, first of all, the, the intellectual level of the people on the trip. There were, I think, three MDs, three PhDs, five master's degrees. This is a, this is a very educated group of people. Dick was a really interesting character, though, because he was a sociologist, and, and he did the first real study of um, the psychology of, of um, how people think at, at altitude and, and taking some chances. So I want to share the audience. This is a, a lovely um, little document that maybe, Tom, you can help us kind of walk through. So um, every, day you'd be, every day you'd be filling these things out, correct? These are, these are diary entries that you would do? That's correct. OK. Maybe we could just even stand up and just kind of talk through this. So this is actually the. Um, it's actually the diary entry the day before you go up to the summit on the West Ridge. You can see that up in the day, up at the top there. Here. <laughs> oh, sorry, my fell okay. Good. <laughs> they don't really want to hear me anyways. <laughs> Thank you. I can give you I can tie a bowl in if you would like. <laughs> so again, this is this is the um, uh, the diary entry that uh, Dick was having you fill out, every day you would be filling out this information of, of various parameters about um, what was happening up on the mountain and also um, kind of emotionally and psychologically how you were approaching the mountain. So anything, anything here that kind of you remember jumps out at you? Oh, yes, there's a lot that jumps out at me. <laughs> First of all, it was this damn diary. It was... Uh, <laughs> uh, Emerson had this study. It was, he wouldn't tell us appropriately, as it turned out, what it was about. But he had these diaries made. And on one page, it, this is what you saw. And then below it was a little space that you could actually write in whatever you wanted to say that day, which was not nearly enough. So most of my uh, extensive uh, recording of my experience was in, written to, uh, in letters home to my then wife, Jean. Uh, the diary was bound in blue, and it had a snap on it, and it said American Mount Everest Expedition in gold, and then your name on it. So that I know somebody tried to throw their diary in a crevasse once, and, <laughs> <laughs> and one of our Sherpas uh, found it and said, Sob, you forgot this. <laughs> but this is the... this. It was May 21st, 1963, up there in the upper left, which was the last, the day before we went from our high camp to the summit. And I didn't take the whole diary. I just tore out the last pages. But I did do what Dick said we should be doing. I filled it out. And what you can see here is we'd go, it's about 8.45 in the evening. This is not Chinese time back then. Uh, uh, as it was when Sharon, I think, uh, uh, climbed the same route of, in 1986. And then we go on from 4W to 5, 4 West to 5 West. Uh, the scale on the numbers now, that, this is critical to Dick's study, is from plus 5 to minus 5. Uh, and plus 5 would be, wow. And minus 5 would be, ugh. <laughs> 
And you can apply it to a whole lot of things. And so right in the middle is zero, uh, which is actually in the study as it turned out to be a scale of motivation. And you'll see some of the things that address it in, in the questions that are asked. So plus five would be, in terms of motivation, certainty of success. And minus five would be certainty of failure. And zero would be maximum uncertainty. The out so you've got yourself here now. I feel um, apprehensive, expectant four. Pretty high up there. You're yeah. pretty convinced you're going to be able to get up there and do no, it. No, that wasn't. I, that isn't saying we were convinced we were going to get up there. That's that's just how charged we were about what we were doing. Okay. And, <laughs> uh, tomorrow I feel weak, strong, one to four, or minus and weather two to four. In though in terrain, you can see that they're hovering around zero. Uh, which feeds into what uh, his hypothesis would be that uncertainty maximizes motivation. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when he analyzed, and then if you go down to the adjective checklist at the bottom and you look at our feelings about the mountain, you'll see that uh, exhilarating, inviting, and provocative, I mean, we're really hooked. <laughs> but uh, we do not, I mean, there's nothing here that uh, I mean, we had no certainty of success whatsoever. We just were certain that we were going to, that we were up, that we were ch ch fully charged, and nothing much was going to mm -hmm. prevent us from and trying. If, if possible, I would like to reach the summit of Mount Everest and down right. the South Call tomorrow. Yeah, great. Have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you do that. You had mentioned before that one of the things that you were really interested in was getting up to altitude and, and think about rock climbing at 28,000 feet. And it's crucial to understand that what, what you were doing on that mountain, um, ascending the Hornbein Kulwar and then getting onto the very top of the West Ridge and to the summit, that's probably the most technical rock climbing that had been done at that kind of altitude in history at this point. This was a, this was a very, very big deal, what you guys did. Well, you know, it's a very big deal, I guess, when you sit here 50 years later looking back on it. But uh, the way I think that I, that I and we were perceiving it at the time is not different from what Willie had done in the Tetons and I had done in the Rockies on the things that were, uh, they weren't training climbs for Everest. They were ends in themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's just a different piece of real estate. And it mm -hmm. happens to have a lot of notoriety. <laughs> But, but, the, but f uh, yes, the same as other things you've done, but in this particular case, fully and utterly committing that it, you're not going to be able to, to start coming back down once you go up. In fact, let me, let me play you the clip from, um, from Base Camp, because this is quite a, I hope you guys can hear this. It, um, it's a little bit raggedy as it would be given the situations. This is a call from, um, from the mountain as you're ascending the, the mountain, um, kind of middle of the day, do you know? Is that, is that about right? It was the last day and after we'd gotten up through the difficult rock climbing and realized that going down it would, well, we thought it would be unappealing, but we could, you play okay. it and then I'll come. And this is Willie talking to Jim Whitaker. Yeah. yeah that's right. See, uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> so you go up. Um, just talk a little bit about that day. You, you're, what time do you leave um, camp that morning? We left about, it's a little different than now. Of course, mm -hmm. flash lights is, uh, are different now. I mean, you, you didn't think of starting in the dark. Uh, and I don't know that we would have thought about that anyway on that on unknown terrain. But uh, I think we really were move, beginning to, we started climbing about seven. We woke up about four in the morning, and it took a god awful amount of time to get our 
shit together, so to speak. And I started to put my, well, I did put my crampons on in the tent. And Willie said, God, Tom, you're going to poke a hole in the air mattress. And I said, it doesn't matter, Willie. We're not coming back here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but it, uh, and the first, oh, the first hour, several hours, up to the, where the crux was, it was slow, steep, mixed snow and a bit of rock and, uh, and fortunately good conditions. And maybe later we can talk a little bit about how lucky we were. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and then we diddled around on a, a, about a 60 foot pitch at the top of the yellow band. And once we were over that, why, I, we never said anything to each other, but uh, I think long before we, we just knew that we, where we were going. The day was beautiful. It was maybe 30 or 40 mile hour winds, but uh, a gorgeous day. The snow conditions were, were god awful perfect. Uh, and we just sort of plunked along. Uh, and we didn't think much about the fact that we were supposed to be maybe met up there by Lou Jurstad and Barry Bishop coming up the other side and wondering whether we were going to get there in time or not. I, we just, you know, we just went for it. Mm -hmm. And it was a blast. I mean, uh, we were having fun uh, uh, watching the mystery unfold. And, and the last little scrambling on rock just below the summit was with drops off on either side like that for thousands of feet uh, was magical. Mm -hmm. uh, not difficult climbing, but uh, uh, you know, you're a long way from home. Mm -hmm. Before you go too far into kind of over-modesting what it is that you did, I just want to um, <laughs> give, some, <laughs> give some context of this. As of uh, just a few days ago, the, the, the numbers are as recent as we can get them. Um, Everest has 6,208 ascents. 3,877 via the Southwest Ridge, and there have been uh, 249 deaths on the mountain so far. The West Ridge that uh, Tom and Willie climbed has had 14 ascents and has had 16 deaths. So after all these years, this few people have, have climbed this route. And I know there's lots of other reasons why the numbers are so much higher on the other routes uh, because of the ease of going there now, the facilitation of the experience and so on, but it's still, Still to this day, it's a huge, huge thing. It's not that the West Ridge has only been attempted 14 times. There have been multiple, multiple attempts on that that aren't captured in, in how many people have actually made it to the summit. This was a, this was a big deal. And you were doing it with um, what kind of rope at that point? Oh, good goal line. Good goal line. Yeah, so how many of you know what goal, goal line is? <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, no harnesses at this point. So this is goal line tied around your waist as you're doing this. Yeah. What are you carrying for gear? For protection. Oh, we had uh, we had a few rock pitons. A few meaning how many? Oh, I don't know, a half dozen. Okay. <laughs> for two thousand feet of climbing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then you get to the top. That's only part of the journey, as we know. What time do you get there? Six fifteen. Six fifteen. How long do you stay? Oh, twenty minutes, okay. maybe. And do you know that your, your colleagues have been there earlier in the day? They got there around 3.50. Yeah, we could see their crampon tracks and ice axe holes in the snow, so we, okay. knew, we knew they had been there. And if you were to take a look at this kind of scale, I don't know if you filled out a diary for this day as well, but if you took a look at apprehension and concern and so on, when you and Willie are standing there at the top and the sun is starting to go down, where are you on the scale then? Well, first of all, I should tell you where I was on the mountain then, mm -hmm. and confess I never thought about it before just now, but uh, my failure to fill out the diary that night. <laughs> uh, you were busy. <laughs> <laughs> no, we weren't doing a damn thing. We were just, well, I guess we were, depending on what you said. I mean, we went down and it got dark and we eventually met up with Luton Berry who were kind of wasted. and. And we just got to a point where we didn't know where to go next, and we had to curl up on our packs and shiver the night away. Uh, no sleeping bags? No. No, no water? No. no food? No, just starlight. <laughs> <laughs> and some heat lightning flashing out on the plains uh, off in the distance beyond Lhotse to tell you there was a world of warmth and flat. Mm -hmm. But you could look up at the ridge of Everest sort of disappearing into the darkness, and it was like... And the stars seems kind of unshimmering, but 
It was like being in a, this little spot in almost in outer space, in, in, a, in a strange space, really. Mm -hmm. We were all curled up in our own thoughts. And I never even thought about filling out the diary. <laughs> Well, you also didn't have headlamps either, did you? I didn't have it. I couldn't have done it even if yeah, no our, our little our headlines, such as they were, the batteries were, which didn't tolerate cold well and didn't tolerate all the weeks they'd already been filling out the di diary that mm -hmm. uh, they, they were kaput when we started down from the summit as a garden. You have a beautiful sentence in the book that's a, a fantastic summary of, of what the odds were that night, and that, that's simply to say, if the wind hadn't died down, we would have. Because it became, for the first time that day, it became a windless day. Yeah, we were, we, I think we were very, very lucky. And uh, I mean, in my, in the forward, what I call the la my last preface to, in the new edition of the Westridge that came out for this 50th, which is the one out there, uh, it gave me, it forced me to really look back on this a bit. And the, uh, and appreciate based on a number of things, how phenomenally lucky we really were. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not to diminish the commitment and all that stuff, but uh, there have been about 60 attempts on Everest over, but since then, I think six successful ascents of the route with about 14 people. Sharon, where are you? Right. Is right. Dwayne here too? Yeah. Anyway, the, 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 they are among the 14 that have summited by that couloir. And, uh, but I, it wasn't until I looked at Liz Hawley's database that uh, uh, as I started to write this and look at, at it that I really appreciated uh, uh, what the odds are like and how fortunate we were. And I'll give you, well, one example, of course, is this bivouac. If there had been a wind that night, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here bullshitting with you. Uh, another is that uh, a few days before we actually made our final push, Willie and I went out to the base of what's called the Hornbein Cool War now. And it was a blustery day with low visibility. And we came back to the tents, and there, to our tent, and there were two more with Barry Corbin and Al Lawton and five of our Sherpas ready for the final push. And then the night a big wind came up and uh, blew those tents, fortunately not all the way off the mountain, but we thought we were finished. But as we had been coming back across the slabs of snow, they were going woomph, woomph, woomph. And when we went back up three or four days later for the final push, no woomphing anymore. That wind had really scoured the mountain mm -hmm. And if Hornbein's avalanche trap really was an avalanche trap, uh, it wasn't when we, I mean, you know, it, these were, there were just events like this happening. Mm -hmm. And listening to uh, Conrad talking yesterday about the conditions trying to get up to the west shoulder, uh, I mean, we were just plunking our feet, sometimes knee deep, but I mean, it was just the kind of snow you like to, uh, there, there was no issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was so, and I think that the, all these attempts that have failed, uh, well, sometimes the people run out of gas, some, but sometimes it's the weather, the wind, uh, that place where the tents blew away may well be the windiest spot on the mountain, uh, which was why it had such a wonderful surface to put a tent on. <laughs> and, uh, and you know various, I mean, the kinds of things that do turn you around. So, mm -hmm. I mean, to go up there and back then with all of the unknown and the naivety and, and just do it, uh, looking back on it from the experience since, but we didn't know, it, mm -hmm. for better and worse, and I would say maybe better, yeah. we didn't have to know all that back then. And if there was luck involved, you were the luckiest of all. You, you actually kept fingers and toes as well, which wasn't the case for anybody else who spent yeah. the night out with you that night. Why do you think that was? What, what do you think you did different? Especially well, I, knowing from a kind of a mountain physiology point of view. What do well, you there are a couple of things uh, that I know I did different. Uh, one is uh, my feet started getting cold and grumbling and grousing. I un undid my, took my crampons off and unloosened my boots, my reindeer fur boots. Uh, Willie, whose feet had been cold all day, as he told me in retrospect, when I asked him, uh, oh, and then, at some point, he, he, he uh, 
treated me like he had many clients on the Grand when he was guiding. And uh, uh, I put my feet on his belly inside his down parka. Uh, and for a while, and they didn't seem to get better, so we gave up on that, and I tucked them back into my boots and asked him if he would like me to do the same. And he said, no, Tom, my feet are fine. And uh, the cold feet of all day, we weren't smart enough to figure out, had turned numb. But the other three had their, you know, crampons with the boots of that era. Uh, and I think the boots are the major technological evolution that I see uh, that, that uh, is different now than it was then. And, uh, we had great Eddie Bauer down clothing and stuff. So uh, uh, I think uh, the crampons are just a, tr a wonderful conductor of cold. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lute didn't lose any of his digits for some reason, even so, but Barry and Willie, Willie's got this little jar, or I should say his widow Jolene and the kids, of these little n nine nubbies <laughs> that the kids like to bring out after dinner parties <laughs> <laughs> before dessert, <laughs> because they got a lot more desserts that way. <laughs> okay, I got more out of you about Everest than then uh, <laughs> I promised you that I would ask you about, but I wanna, I wanna turn to post Everest because that it certainly be wasn't the case that that was your entire life, that um, there was a lot after that, um, particularly in, in terms of medicine. But I wanna, I wanna focus on one thing first, and that's, um, you, know, you, did, you did mention you were gone for a long time um, and that you, know, you left a lot behind. One of the things that you and I had spoken about is that that, that whole um, life of adventure, when you go for that long particularly, can be pretty hard on the people that are, are left at home. What was, what was kind of the aftermath for you and your colleagues of, of having gone to Everest in terms of family, in terms of moving forward? There was some fame attached to, to having climbed the mountains. What was it like for you afterwards? I think we're about to leave advanced space in the coom and head out uh, into the unknown here. But, uh, <laughs> uh, a little bit of uncertainty. Uh, well, if you look at, I don't, I haven't, I've lost track of the numbers, but when we all got back, there were uh, quite a number of divorces, one or two marriages. Uh, so clearly, for many of us, uh, that expedition was sort of a tipping point in other respects. Mm -hmm. And uh, my marriage ended five years later, but my marriage, if Everest was the tipping point, uh, the reasons for it for both uh, Jean and I really much predated that as mm -hmm. the case in life in general. Yeah. Uh, so there was a lot of change in, and, uh, in many people's lives. Was it a turning point for you? That, did, it, did it reframe something about yourself yeah, or that's a, what you uh, wanted? Uh, Well, one of the things I knew when I left Everest was that I was never going back there. To Everest or to the Himalaya? Uh, to Everest. To Everest. And yeah. sort of it's been to Nepal, but I, I, it's, it was mainly Everest. Mm -hmm. And there were two reasons for it then. Uh, one was that, uh, I mean, the experience in its, all of its facets was so unique that it was non-replicable. Mm -hmm. And I know going back, each experience is unique, but uh, I didn't, I, I couldn't see trying to revisit the, the, the past. Did you imagine be disappointed if you, if you saw what, what happened? Uh, yeah, I think okay. I might have. Yeah. And the other reason though, which may have been more compelling, was I was really just starting my academic career. And I was loaded with lots of uncertainty in terms of my ability as a doc, a teacher, a researcher, et cetera. Uh, that whole adventure was yet ahead. And I wanted, I really wanted to just stuff Everest into a box and forget about it. I couldn't, but I was able for... Couldn't because other people wouldn't let you or... Right, you, I mean, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I was able to be pretty schizophrenic for a long time and keep that over here and just drive my career the way I wanted it to go as best I could. And... Uh, the, one of the most refreshing things that would happen would be when one of my faculty or residents would say, discover years after they'd known me in my professional capacity, discovering that I had climbed Everest. And 
And uh, what was so nice about that was to realize that my relationship with them had, didn't have that influencing uh, their assessment. They were judging me on my capacities right. uh, in our interaction together. And those occasions when that would happen were always and still are really nice. Yeah. One of the things that was really interesting for me to hear from some of your medical colleagues was that, who also know you're, you're climbing, some of them climbers themselves, as they said, however famous Tom is in the mountain world, for Everest, he's far more famous in the medical world for his research, which I thought was a very telling thing about um, the way you're respected there. That's very nice. I'm not sure it's true, but uh, uh, you take you know the, you take whatever the reality is. And but it, I mean, I had a very fulfilling professional life, mm -hmm. and I guess looking back on it now and seeing. Uh, some of the people that trained in our program uh, and what they're doing with their own lives and realizing that I was part of helping that to happen. It's wow. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. When, um, when you think about kind of what we understand now, I want to talk about just about your, your work in altitude medicine and hypoxia. What, what do we understand now that we didn't, or you didn't know back in 1963? Have things changed that much? Are we that much further along in our understanding of altitude? Oh yes, in certain ways, very much in certain ways. But if you ask uh, how much that understanding really applies to how people fare on Everest now, mm -hmm. I would say that most of, that, of what we've learned really has come from just the experience of people being there. And, I mean, if you look at, I mean, I don't want to go get into the whole story of Everest now versus then, mm -hmm. but if you simply look at the numbers of people that are going there and being moved up and down the mountain with uh, an outcome in terms of mortality that has not increased with the increasing numbers. and the In whole, fact, decreased quite a bit. Well, I don't specifically know that, but it certainly has... You know, and, and, but it has, you would think statistically, for example, going through the ice fall, that with, with uh, more pins to be bowled down, uh, there'd be a, the mortality might go up, but it hasn't. And it's, it's, it's due to, the whole thing is now sort of programmed in a remarkable way to move fairly large numbers of people up there, two large numbers, you one might say, uh, Conrad. Uh, and uh, and do it with so far modicum safety and facility, but I do worry about it. Mm -hmm. But that's all due to just pushing back the barriers of the unknown in terms of how people perform at altitude. And when we climbed Everest, we used oxygen. Uh, we had a discussion about maybe not on the southeast ridge, and that was. But uh, well, what did you think as a physician at that point? Did you guess that it would be possible to do it without oxygen? Well, I don't know that I had any superior wisdom, but I sort of knew it could be done without oxygen. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing I wasn't sure of is whether logistically, with the increased time it might take, and that, but I knew physiologically, physiologically it could. How did I know that? Well, partly from Charlie Houston's. Uh, Operation Everest One chamber study back that was published in '46, where they, he took naval volunteers and put them in a chamber and acclimatized them over 40 some odd days to the top of Everest, and watched them acclimatize and function. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was pretty sure that what uh, Reinhold Messner and Peter Hoppler did 15 years later uh, was going to happen at some point. Mm -hmm. Not every, I have to say, not everybody would have agreed with me back mm -hmm. then. Do you get a sense that um, oxygenless ascents of Everest are out of the scope of most people, or what, what's allowing those people who are able to do that to do That's it? a really interesting question, and we don't really, uh, I think that uh, oxygenless ascents, that is supplemental oxygen, uh, are probably within the scope of more people than we know, than we know. but not by any means everybody. Mm -hmm. And it may, may well be that the majority can't. I would be pretty damn sure there were people on our expedition that could have done it without using oxygen, because there 
we were genetically probably not a different breed than those who are the minority that are doing it now. Are you one of them, do you think? Knowing how you acclimatize and well, I wouldn't, you be sur- I wouldn't be surprised. Huh. Uh, whether and it might have made climbing that sixty foot step without oxygen. <laughs> I don't know. That would have been challenging without yeah. oxygen. I think. What do you think, Jack? It looked pretty challenging. <laughs> <laughs> Is there even a, a, a touch of regret in the back of your mind that you used it? Well, God, that's an interesting. Uh, you know, when I first met Charlie Houston, who I'd read about in High Conquest, it was when we came back to Delhi from Everest, and John Kenneth Galbraith, who was the American ambassador uh, in India, had this nice uh, lunch for us around his swimming pool, and Charlie really grilled me uh, about the climb, and he extolled how wonderful it was, and then there was this little note of, wouldn't it have been nice if you could have done it without? (laughs) And I have to agree, that would have been nice. Uh, But it was was not where... Mm -hmm. Uh, how many of you have read Tito Lejada Flores' Games, Games Climbers Play? Mm-hmm. Uh, lots of you. Well, uh, and, and that, the theme of, of that article is exactly the same as Emerson's Uncertainty Principle. And as, and as, the, as things evolve and become more certain, then you define new flavors to maintain uncertainty. And, of course, eventually oxygen, oxygenless ascents, uh, winter ascents, and et cetera. It's just a natural evolution of what mountaineering is, and any endeavor in life, really. Mountains are, for me, just a great big uh, hairy metaphor for Mm -hmm. what the rest of existence is all about. We we talked yesterday about you've been pretty well served by having climbed Everest, and particularly at the time that you did it, and uh, it's brought you a number of things in your life. But one of the interesting things you said to me, too, was that you were really glad that you weren't the first American to have climbed it. What did you mean by that? Well, <clears throat> uh, being the, I, I, I don't know whether, I mean, Jim was the first American, and Jim, uh, I think for him that was, impo- that was very important. To be first. To be first. Mm-hmm. Uh, for those of us on the West Ridge, yeah, you know, we had discussions uh, where we would frame it. If you knew that you, we weren't going to get to the top, would you still be interested in attempting to climb the West Ridge? And Emerson allowed us how he, uh, he would still be interested. Willie and I didn't quite trust that. But we didn't know that. And so uh, uh, we thought, well, maybe we can pull it off. But we knew we didn't, uh, we, we preferred that to, the other, uh, to being the first American. Uh, the, the idea of having to come back and sort of carry that mantle with the public was beyond anything I want. I, I, it would have been very, it, it could have been very distracting, and I would have done a, a lousy job of it, I think. Mm-hmm. And Jim did a wonderful job with it. It was part of what, it, it, it related to what he was doing professionally, running REI, and, uh, <laughs> to his his own, to who he was. And he took a lot of the heat, I think, off of me and Willie. Mm -hmm. And so being the the fourth or the fifth, I don't think you've ever declared which of the two of you got to the top first that day, but Uh, being the the fourth or the fifth um, kind of allowed you to do the other things you've done in your life as well to uh, to a much probably greater degree with less distraction or other kind of pressures. Yeah, I think think Jim uh, uh, freed us up, at least freed me up to... uh, uh, to just get on with the rest of my life. Yeah. And I thank him for it. Yeah. Well, let's, let's finish with that. I've got a thousand other things to ask you about, but I, we do have to finish we'll up talk here. talk fast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's it mountain life like for you these days? Sorry? What's mountain life like for you these days? What do you do? What, what's, your, what's your interaction with mountains these days? Well, they're part of my soul. And I live in them, and... I breathe from them, <laughs> and I wander up the slabs behind our house on Lumpy Ridge and look at the front range out there, and I feel like it's magic. And we have, in, Kathy and I and Estes, 
something when we moved there seven years ago we didn't really anticipate. Uh, we live in a very simple environment compared to living in a city. Uh, but we have a community of very close friends, the kinds of friends who, when someone among us has troubles, they all circle the wagons. Yeah. It, yeah. it couldn't be much better. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Tom Warren,